Hi, everyone. I'm Sharanya. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm Food Empowerment Project's Executive Director. I'm going to describe myself for you. I have short, dark hair. I'm of South Indian origin, and I'm wearing a blue tunic with white fan-shaped patterns on it. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your Sunday with us. Welcome to event three of our Eat Your Ethics four-part series. We're so excited to have you here with us. For those of you who don't know who we are, Food Empowerment Project is a vegan food justice organization that was founded in 2007 by a very proud Chicanx woman, Lauren Ornelas, who you will hear from during today's event. We work on a wide variety of issues with four core programmatic areas. We promote ethical veganism for the animals through education, outreach, and providing culturally relevant resources to help individuals go and stay vegan. We advocate for the rights of farm workers by supporting corporate, legislative, and regulatory changes. We work with community members to survey access to healthy foods in black and brown communities. And we work to inform consumers around the globe about the worst forms of child labor, including slavery that take place for chocolate. The goal of our event series is to provide you with information and resources that will help you eat with your ethics. In today's event, we will be covering all things that relate to the ocean. We will give you a bit of background on our fight for the ocean effort, talk about sea creatures who are exploited for food, feature conversations with two individuals who are using their talents to help spread the word on why we should care about ocean life. And finally, we will give you ideas for how to lend your voice. And of course, we will have a Q&A at the end so be sure to utilize that Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to send us your questions. And if needed, we're planning on staying longer than the allo allocated time for this event to make sure we answer all of your questions. So please do send them in. Also, we've opened up the chat box. So please do say hello and let us know where you're joining us from. For those of you tuning in today, we will also send a follow-up email with resources that we will be sharing throughout this event. And we will send you a survey to get your input on how we can improve future events. Now, I just wanna bring up a slide to show you what we have coming up on the schedule for a future event. We have a fight for the ocean week of events that we have planned around our fight for the ocean effort. And I will go through the schedule a bit more towards the end of this program, but we will have cooking demonstrations and we will have our first ever book club uh, where we will be discussing Undrowned, which is a book that we will be talking about during this event. Uh, and we will also be featuring an interview with Dr. Giles, who is a ORCA researcher and expert. So we hope you will join us for that event as well. As a reminder, we have one final event in this series on October 24th, where we will show you even more ways to eat with your ethics. We will be covering humane myths, and that will be held on October 24th at 1 p.m. Pacific time. As we begin this event, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the land that we are currently residing on. We recognize that this land was stolen from the original habit inhabitants of these areas. And we wanna take a moment to honor, remember, and pay our respects to the elders, both past and present, who have stewarded this land for generations. We're also very excited to share with you that as we have done in past Eat Your Ethics events, we will have a prize that we will share with one lucky participant who stays on until the very end of today's event. The prize will include our recipe booklets, vegan Mexican food and vegan Filipino food, stickers, including a brand new one that was made just for the fight for the ocean effort, and even more. So stay tuned for a chance to win. Before we begin, we would love to know how many of you attending today are vegan 
or are here to learn why we should all consider veganism. We're gonna bring up a quick poll on screen for you to answer. We will give you a few seconds to select your response. How many of you have been vegan for less than six months? Vegan for six months to two years? Vegan for two years or more? Or are here because you're interested in going vegan? Wow, I see we have a wide variety of people attending. Thank you for being here, welcome. And for those of you not currently vegan, but interested, we are very excited to have you here. And we hope to share resources with you that will help you with that decision. And welcome again to today's event. None of what we're doing at Food Empowerment Project would be possible without our entire close-knit team working tirelessly every single day to advance our mission. You will meet our staff throughout this event. And I would like to kick off today's event with a brief discussion on workers in the fishing industry. We have a new page on our website that talks about this issue in depth, and I encourage you to visit that website and learn even more. But it is clear that commercial fishing is a cruel industry when it comes to animals. And our new page talks about workers who work on these boats, on these fishing vessels, and the research that shows that they endure extreme physical and mental abuse with no hope of escape while out at sea. The page is extremely detailed and will give you a lot more information on this. And again, as I said before, I highly encourage you to look at that and learn more about the workers in the fishing industry. Now, I would like to bring on Lauren Ornelas, Food Empowerment Project's founder, who will talk about her inspiration for our fight for the ocean effort. Hello, everyone. First and foremost, thank you all so much for joining us today. You know, there's a lot going on in the world today, so we are honored to have you spending some of your Sunday with us. Um, as um, Shadanya said, I'm Laura Nellas. I'm the founder of Food Empowerment Project. My pronouns are she, her. I'm going to describe myself. I have short, dark hair. I'm wearing glasses and I am of Mexican descent and I'm wearing a dress that has sharks on it as well as earrings that are probably harder for you to see. I'm really excited about today's event because I really love ocean creatures, especially sharks, as you can tell. They are my favorite animals. Um, and I just wanted, we thought it'd be a good idea just to give you an idea of where the concept of Fight for the Ocean came from. And although I've loved the ocean for a very long time, it came to me while I was watching a documentary. Um, I have the privilege of having Netflix. And if anybody else does, the documentary is called Mission Blue. But it's about an oceanographer named Dr. Sylvia Earle, who was doing the work that she was doing and exploring the oceans um, a very long time ago, down back in the 1950s. She's in her 80s now. She's still with us. But the documentary um, did a lot to show and interview a woman who I wish I had known. I wanted to be a marine biologist um, when I was younger. And really, when I was growing up, the only oceanographer most of us had heard of was Jacques Cousteau. And pretty much everybody who I saw on the shows with him were all men. And so it was incredible to find out that there was a woman doing all this work for the oceans that I had never even heard of. And I, well, I felt like a responsibility that more people should know who she is. Um, I also wanted to mention that in the documentary, I, although I credit this documentary and I really did enjoy it, I was also a bit insulted as a woman that many of the topics that they covered her with her were very specifically things that they would have only said to a woman including talking about how attractive she was and how she cared about these issues, about being a scientist and about her divorces and things like that. So I wrote an entire blog about this documentary and the start of it being the start of Fight for the Ocean, although we had to take a lot of paragraphs out because of my opinions about that stuff. Um, she actually lived underwater for a bit of time, about two weeks, I believe. And in this time, she talked about learning the personalities of the fish and, you know, recognizing fish that she would see every morning come by. And so it wasn't a surprise that in the documentary, when they asked her about eating fish, she says she doesn't even eat fish. And I have to admit to you, that's when this got my attention. A lot of times you watch documentaries 
about animals in the ocean and they don't quite extend that a circle of compassion to those who they consume. And the fact that she said she didn't eat fish has really got my attention. And I started watching it a little bit more closely even. And um, I sensed the urgency on her voice and the concern that she had. And it was very infectious. And so I came back to work the next day and my colleague at that time, Erica, and I said, I have this idea for creating a, an effort called Fight for the Ocean. I don't want us just to walk for the ocean. I don't want us just to save the ocean. We need to fight for her. We need to fight for every creature living beneath the seas. And so the campaign that we currently have is basically twofold. One is for all of those compassionate people who are out there who see often whales or sea turtles caught in nets and understandably are outraged by what it is that they see they have that compassion in them, but they don't necessarily make the connection that the reason why those nets exist to begin with is for the consumption of other sea creatures. We may not be catching the whales and the sea turtles and the dolphins in the net for human consumption, but we certainly are using them to consume other animals. And my goal was to try to get people, especially those people who already have the compassion in their hearts, to stop eating sea creatures with an understanding that everything is connected there. And so by, by having those nets to kill shrimp or tuna or whoever it may be in the ocean, they are inherently killing other creatures in that ocean. And of course, we want everybody to have compassion to the smallest, to the largest of these animals as well. And hopefully today you'll get a glimpse into some of who these special beings are. But also a part of that was the desire for even vegans, for those of us to recognize that by not eating sea creatures, we are absolutely doing a big step and helping to fight for the ocean. But the circumstances are dire and we need to do even more. So we also started coordinating ocean cleanups, beach cleanups, creek and river cleanups on August 30th in honor of Dr. Sylvia Earle's birthday, which happens to be August 30th. So these are all the reasons why we created Fight for the Ocean. And we were really excited for the first two years we were able to do these cleanups and on, on August 30th, um, where we actually had um, cleanups taking place not only around the United States, but also internationally. And it was growing. Um, we started from having Canada, but then also adding New Zealand, and then COVID hit. So last year, we had just simple things that people could do up on our website. And this year, what we've done is we've actually expanded it to be an entire week, which you saw the schedule. We'll pop it up again later. You'll hear more about it today. But basically, a week long of activities with vegan cooking demos, um, from vegan chefs from around the world. Um, we have interviews with scientists. We have a discussion about reusables. We have the Undrowned Book Club um, that we're gonna be doing, which is basically a, a black feminist book about marine mammals and more. She also talks about sharks. But the whole goal of this has always been to make sure that even though COVID's taking place and all that's going on and we need to protect each other, that there is always more that we can do to save those beneath the waves. And we need to do everything that we can. Nothing is ever gonna be enough. So we must put our all into it. So that is my bit. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Megan now. And I'm really excited um, for you all to meet Megan. She is the newest member of the Food Empowerment Project team. And I'm absolutely and utterly excited to have her a part of the work that we're doing. And she has already made herself so integral to all that we do as an organization and hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Hello, everyone. Um, I think that my screen is on. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Megan Satterfield, and I am FEP's new executive and programs assistant. Um, so I identify with she, her pronouns. Um, I have long, dark hair, and I am of Chinese descent, um, and I am also wearing a blue t-shirt with floral print. Um, so today, I want to contribute to the conversation by sharing some of my personal low-waste and uh, eco-friendly favorites. Okay. The first point um, that I want to address might be a little obvious, but I did want to make sure to emphasize um, how detrimental single use plast plastics are for our environment. Um, it's also important to remember that an incentive to, or like another incentive to avoid many of these big use single plastic companies like Nestle and Coca-Cola is because their water privatization schemes hurt people and the environment. Um, but that's a different conversation, but an obvious like 
the thing that we can do to try to combat that is to get your own single or your own reusable water bottle. Um, and then back to my eco-friendly favorites, my other ones. Um, so I think that it's an easy small change to pack your own like reusable utensils. I have this that folds up pretty small and I just put it into my lunchbox every day. Um, you can bring your own reusable bags to the grocery store and to the farmer's markets. And one of my favorite like life hacks is to reuse glass and pasta, uh, like glass pasta jars and jam containers. Um, and you can just pack lunches into that. Um, or you can check out your local thrift shop for glass and Pyrex goods and you don't have to like spend a lot of money to make uh, a change. Um, okay, and then I'm going to pass this off to Amanda to look at the Gentileska interview. Hi everybody, thank you so much, Megan. My name is Amanda, my pronouns are she and they, and I am FEP's campaigns associate. I'm also gonna provide a visual description of myself for everybody. I'm a white person with short brown hair and I'm wearing glasses and a white and blue and turquoise dress. So on World Ocean Day 2021, which was on June 8th, I interviewed Jen Teleska, who was the author of a book called Red Gold, The Managed Extinction of the Atlantic Bluefin Tuna. And the following are a few excerpts from my interview with Jen. Her book, Red Gold, goes behind one of the scenes of ocean governance to show the conditions that are leading to the loss of one of the planet's last big fish, the giant bluefin tuna. Dr. Teleska is the Assistant Professor of Environmental Justice in the Department of Social Science and Cultural Studies at the Pratt Institute. So please enjoy this bit of the interview and check out the link in the chat box to watch the rest. Of everything that you've learned about the bluefin tuna fishes over the years, what are some of the most amazing facts that you could share with us? So there are lots of them. <laughs> These um, really, they're extraordinary creatures like all creatures are. If only people took the time to get to know them um, so just to give you a sense of the bluefin, so these are one of the fastest fish at sea. The only fish that is faster than the bluefin is the sailfish. So they quite literally accelerate faster uh, than a Porsche. Um, they uh, cruise the ocean with mates um, capable of weighing well over a ton. So, you know, it's kind of like imagine a stampeding pack of horses underwater um, and that's pretty much what it's like to imagine um, the, the bluefin. These are um, also, I think it's important to recognize that these are actually warm blooded animals. They're somewhere on the evolutionary scale between a cold blooded cod and a uh, seafaring dolphin or whale. Um, so, be and it's really the, it's her warm blood that enables um, her to elevate her internal temperature higher than surrounding water. Um, so she can then dive to depths that are, you know, um, you know, where the water starts to become black and icy cold. Um, and yet she can also just quite literally shoot across the ocean. I mean, the entire Atlantic Ocean in less than 40 days from the shores of the US and Canadian Maritimes in order to enter that tiny eight mile stretch of the Strait of Gibraltar to enter the Mediterranean Sea. Um, so this is the Atlantic variety of bluefin. I should also say too, just to clarify for the audience um, that my book focuses on the Atlantic bluefin, but there are also um, bluefin found um, in the Northern and uh, Southern hemispheres uh, in the Pacific Ocean as well. Can you tell us more a little bit about what it is, who it is that is threatening? the giant bluefin tuna? So I think it's important to understand um, in some ways, the, the simple answer is us people, not all people, um, a pretty narrow slice of people that is um, those who are catching bluefin, managing bluefin, eating bluefin as sushi. Um, these are the relatively privileged of the world. Um, so that's really to say that the threats to the bluefin stem from human activity. Um, so we know the climate crisis is felt at sea. Um, right? So we know, for example, that the carbon released into the atmosphere um, is received at sea as ocean acidification. 
There are some scientists that suggest that ocean acidification might affect their um, migratory patterns, their spawning habits, we don't really know. There's a tendency to think that, um, that the problem here is that the numbers have been driven down. And that's important for sure. But I think equally as important is the recognition that it's not just the number, but it's the size of the animal that has also decreased, right? So, um, so there's this sense in which, um, and so this is why, um, you know, for me in that, in that opening prologue, it's, it's homage to a former ocean giant, right? It's, um, and so part of what happens is that fish aren't people, right? They, um, that the older and more mature a fish is, the more that fish contributes to future generations. And so what happens when you remove um, the larger, older fish, you're effectively creating an ocean of teenagers. Right? And so that in itself um, is also problematic, right? So in many ways, the, the whole seafood sector, um, I, I mean, is, is deeply, I mean, it's deeply problematic, both ethically and, and politically. Part of FEP's fight for the ocean effort, as I said, is that we highlight the impact of eating sea creatures in our ocean. We encourage people to stop eating them in order to fight for the ocean. So what has all of your research and all that you've talked about um, taught you about how we need to fight for the ocean? Yeah, you know, I have to say, I, um, I really appreciate the way you phrased the question. Right, so, so you phrased the question, what do we need to do to fight for the ocean, right? So, um, which is different than what we typically get, which is um, what do we need to do to save the ocean? Um, and I, part of what um, I've, I've learned through the project is the recognition that um, this language of, of saving the ocean or saving the bluefin or saving the whale or the vaquita um, is deeply problematic. Um, and there's a, a whole chapter in the book that talks about this, but in any case, I think the point is that for me, a more productive frame is to think about not how we might save the animal, but how we might move, up, move to a place where we respect and revere and honor the animal as a precondition, as a precondition to ever save Right, this creature. And I guess really, you know, just to, to share with you and the, the audience is, you know, it's the sense that, um, you know, these are not merely animals that um, are machines, right, that are available uh, and ready made for human consumption. These aren't animals who merely, you know, eat, mate, defecate, and die, right, that, um, that these are not fish stocks for sale, uh, like on Wall Street. Um, uh, nor are they just like, again, you know, passively awaiting our consumption, um, but rather to see them, you know, to kind of imagine a world where fish become co-creators in this life, where they have social lives, they have, um, they are not only in the world, they are aware of the world, right? And for me, it's the inability or the unwillingness um, culturally to venerate our fellow beings um, that lies at the root of our ecological crisis. Thank you all for watching. I hope you learned something from the interview clips. So next we have a bit of trivia for all of you who are watching. Pull up. All right, so how large can bluefin tuna fishes grow to? A, 1.5 feet, B, two feet, C, four feet, or D, 10 feet. Give you a minute to put in your answers. So um, the majority of you are correct. It is 10 feet. They can get up to 10 feet long. Um, thank you so much for guessing. Um, all right, so next I'm gonna pass it off to Elise who is going to start talking to you all a bit about sea creatures. Thanks so much, Amanda. 
Um, my name is Elise. I'm Food Empowerment Projects Development Associate. Um, grateful to be joining you all here today. I'm going to describe myself a bit. Um, so I am a, I'm oh, sorry, my pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm a white woman with red hair and I'm wearing a, a blue shirt with florals on it. Uh, so we just learned some amazing information about the bluefin tuna from Jen Teleska, and I hope you all feel like you you learned a lot and are you know intrigued to learn more about these creatures. And I want to dive in to talk a little bit more about fish in general. Um, so you know, fish are fascinating creatures. Uh, you know, watching them glide through the water can be incredibly mesmerizing, and and it looks really effortless, but really they have these finely tuned muscles that contract and thrust them through the water. Um, there are over 25,000 varietals of fish with new species being discovered every day, uh, which, you know, our oceans are just, our ocean is so fascinating for the reason that it's, it's there's so much that we still don't know um, and we're discovering every day. Uh, fish are, are actually really attuned to the physical properties in water and they do this to avoid predators and, and also to find prey. Uh, for instance, their sense of smell can help them distinguish between different chemical compounds in the water as they get you know, closer to certain environments or other sea creatures. They also have excellent memories and can remember prey and predators for months. And uh, for instance, carp, they, after being caught by a fish fisherman, will avoid hooks for at least a year. Um, so, you know, their memories help uh, protect them and, and help them prolong their life. And like us, it, it creates different memories and reasons for doing things. Um, I don't know about you, but I love videos of fish that befriend different divers and they like come back to um, see them year after year or, you know, go to familiar places. And I, I just find that so truly beautiful to see um, not only the bonds, but the relationships that they create and they maintain. Um, something also really cool about fish is they have these lateral line systems. And so what that means is that their bones and their neurons detect these faint vi vibrations in the water and they can also detect the changing depths and pressure. And this allows fish to swim in large groups while looking like they're one moving being. And that to me is one of the most truly beautiful and fascinating things about fish is, you know, I feel like maybe there's this misconception that, you know, it's just a school of fish and they, they don't really think they, they're not individuals, but really they're, they're so attuned to one another and they're so aware of all of, all of the other fish around them that they choose to move as one. And I, I just think that's so beautiful. Um, you know, to move on to some harder stuff to talk about, it's, it's no doubt in the scientific community that fish feel pain. And we may not recognize it as easily, right? Like when I see my dogs, Daisy or Carly, um, it's really easy to see when they're in pain, they express that and it's really recognizable to us. Um, but with fish uh, specifically, you know, they're, the way they express pain is more subtle and a little bit harder for us to relate. Um, you know, by FEP standard, any fish or any creature killed is unsustainable. But even by other standards, fish are bring, being caught, killed, and consumed at an unsustainable rate. It's disrupting the ocean biodiversity. And, and you know, the process is just incredibly cruel. Um, after being removed from the water, they may spend hours or days on the deck of a ship. And, you know, then they're surrounded by unfamiliar sights and smells and feelings. You know, they're used to being in the water and, and then they're stacked on one another and piled and thrown. There's like no regard for their life at that point. And once on land, they either suffer slow deaths as they're packed onto ice or they are delivered to stores and restaurants to be killed on site. That's, you know, there's no humane method for killing animals. And with these invertebrates, there's, there's no exception. It's, it's just not humane. There's no way to do that other than to let them live their lives. Um, 
there's so much information to share about fish and I, I we continue talking forever, but <laughs> we don't necessarily have the time. So if you wanna learn more, please visit our website. There's gonna be um, a link in the chat box. Uh, I also, um, I'm gonna talk now a little bit about crustaceans, um, which are some really other rad sea creatures that I am would love to share a little bit more with you about. So uh, crustaceans are among the most highly specialized invertebrates. Um, you know, their jointed bodies allow for this free range of motion, even though they have these rigid exoskeletons that are there to protect them. Um, to grow, crustaceans uh, actually continually shed that armor. And in the days after molting, their skin is extremely soft and flexible. And that allows for rapid growth, but it also leaves them very susceptible to um, predators. So they spend a lot of time hiding. Uh, and the molting process actually consumes most of the, the crustacean's life. Uh, so that is what they spend a majority of their time doing. Um, lobsters, crabs, and shrimp range in color. You know, they, they can be transparent or they can be really vivid, reds and blues, and color is an incredibly important part of their world. Um, it's used for courting and camouflaging and sending messages of aggression. Um, it's, yeah, color display is critical to their life. You know, some crabs such as hermit crabs seek out objects like shells to aid in that camouflage. And this allows them to simultaneously hide from predators um, and stealthily stalk their prey. And it's like also their like ultimate fashion, you know, <laughs> eco fashion, right? No, just kidding. But um, you know, unfortunately with crustaceans as well, the killing process is very, very cruel. Um, for lobsters and crabs, the most common method of killing includes decapitation and live dismemberment or being boiling alive. And, it, you know, it's done once again for the pleasure and the consumption of, of humans. Um, you know, it's really incredibly heartbreaking stuff. And you know, I, I hope that, you know, you feel like you learned a little bit more about fish and crustaceans and, you know, want to learn more about them to advocate them, uh, advocate for them um, in a better way or more. Uh, so please check out the link uh, that we're posting in the chat to learn a little bit more about beautiful sea creatures like crustaceans that are in our ocean. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it back off to Megan and she's going to share uh, more information on some other sea creatures. Hi, Elise. Thank you so much for that. That was awesome. I learned so much about fish and crustaceans, and it truly is crazy to see like how in tune fish are, and I wish that we could all be like that. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm going to first be talking about sharks, um, which actually fall under a category known as condictories, Condictes, um, which is a class that contains fish that have skeletons primarily composed of cartilage. Um, that would include your sharks, rays, skates, sawfish, and um, ghost sharks. Um, so the Earth's, or the Earth's ocean is home to over 350 species of sharks, ranging in size from the seven inch dwarf dog shark to the 50 foot whale shark. These magnificent animals have a fossil record dating back to over 400 million years, which places them among the most ancient species of fish on the planet. Um, so as keystone predators, sharks play an integral role in maintaining the structure and stability of um, our marine ecosystems throughout the world. And one of the most devastating practices in fishing industry today is the removal of shark fins for their uh, for usage um, in expensive and delicacy meals, one of the most popular being shark fin soup. Um, so some sharks take as long as 15 years to reach full maturity and they birth a very small number of offsprings. And consequently, many of these species that are targeted for their spins are experiencing a shark population decline because they're hunted for um, the use of like these luxury meals. Um, and you can learn about more about shark finning on our website. Um, 
and then I'm going to move on to mollusk. So in case you are like me and you didn't know, um, the term mollusk encompasses octopus, squid, scallops, clams, and oysters. Um, so mollusk, oh, like crustaceans, are also invertebrates, and they have a fossil record dating back to over 555 million years, which is crazy. Um, so their marine habitat is extensive, and this ranges from the shallow, um, like tidal zones, um, like tide pools that you might have seen, like if you've taken a walk on the beach, um, to the pitch black ocean floor, some of it which hasn't even been explored yet. Um, they have exceptional senses of sight, smell, and touch. Um, and they are very interesting and unique creatures um, and have abilities that we are not even aware of um, and will never be capable of. Um, and so both crustaceans, which Elise talked uh, extensively about, and mollusk are extracted from the world's oceans on a staggering scale. And it's really sad to hear that um, the way that they are like fished from the oceans are measured in metric tons rather than recognized as individuals. So nobody really knows how many of these animals are actually killed um, for human consumption each day and each year. Um, you can learn more about wild fish and more about these uh, sea creatures um, on our website at a link in our chat box. Um, and that will take us to our third poll question. Okay, so approximately how many species of fish uh, do we think are alive today? So many good guesses. Okay. Let's see, wait a little bit longer for everyone to vote. Okay, and I'm going to end the poll. And we've got a good variety of answers. And it looks like, okay, the majority of you put 25,000, and that is actually correct. So, so far, there are 25,000 species of fish that we currently know of. Um, and I'm going to pass it back to Elise. Uh, yeah, pretty cool, you know, as, as I said earlier too, and we're discovering new species every day. So yeah, that's just what we know of. Um, and to help protect all of these sea creatures, we wanna share some more tips for reducing waste. Um, so I know Megan shared some really great options in terms of just, you know, everyday reusables that you can use. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of my favorite reusable products uh, that I use that are just like more personal products um, and that are low waste, plastic free, things like that. So um, here I have like my deodorant tube. This is a cardboard um, tube, so it's completely compostable. There are tons of options out there in terms of, you know, brands that you can use and scents and all types of things, but I really love using this deodorant and it's in a cardboard tube, which is really cool and fun and different. Um, I also sharing some other fun stuff, toothbrush and toothpaste. I mean, it might seem kind of silly, but you know, we're supposed to replace our toothbrush. I think it's every three months. And so if you think about that, you know, how many toothbrushes get used in a lifetime and then also the plastic tubes that come with toothpaste. So this is a bamboo toothbrush and while the bristles, you have to remove them before you can compost the whole brush, um, it dramatically reduces waste. And then I use toothpaste bites. I've been using them for about two years now and I love them, um, but yeah, they're really cool. They're just like little bites that you can pop into your mouth so you don't even have to think about it. And super great for travel. Um, so yeah, I, I love toothpaste bites and, and then, you know, it's in a glass jar. So you're just refilling every time. Um, another thing I, I really love is sun. Well, I need sunscreen all the time. I wear it every day. Um, so one thing I love to use is my zinc sunscreen. Uh, so, and it comes, this one comes in a tin. So what's cool is as, as soon as it's empty, I can reuse it. It can be a storage container. Um, but also by using a zinc based sunscreen and then being conscious about, you know, if I do hop into any body of water, I'm not putting chemicals into that water. So, um, you know, especially as we're talking about oceans, zinc based sunscreen is what's going to be ocean and reef safe. So, um, you know, definitely it, these things can be easily worked into, you know, if you have the privilege to, um, you know, have a choice on some of these items. Uh, there's 
a lot of alternatives out there to, you know, plastic tubes and, you know, spray sunscreen with chemicals in it and things like that, that's bad for the water. So I uh, just wanted to share some of the fun things that I have at my house that I love to use that are low waste. And I hope it inspires you to check out some other options. Um, and with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, yeah, we're going to share a, a great interview with uh, Amanda and an artist, Katie and Sharktopia. So let's go ahead and play the interview. Hey everyone, this is Amanda and I'm the campaign's associate for Food Empowerment Project. Right now we are here with vegan ocean artist Katie Rose, who is the creator of Sharktopia, an artistic endeavor of altering the misconceptions of sharks and other misunderstood beings. Her art is also put to use in nonprofit campaigns for activism and awareness. And you can find more than 100 free coloring and activity pages on her website one of which was a collaboration with Food Empowerment Project for our Fight for the Ocean effort. Katie, thank you so much for joining us today. It's really great to have you. We're huge fans of your art and the difference that it makes. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. So my first question that I have is, what made you realize that you wanted to help sharks? Uh, the short answer is, in 2011, I discovered shark finning and the horrors of how many sharks were being killed each year. And it just didn't seem sustainable. It didn't seem right. And I've been drawing sharks all my life, give or take a couple of years. Um, so I was just really shocked. So that was like in 2011. And by 2014, after having posted some of my art online, and seeing the connection that my art had with people, I started Sharktopia and just tried to start the process of raising awareness about shark finning and bycatch and the endless issues that our ocean is currently facing. That's awesome. Um, and so do you know what it was like, what is it that um, draws you to sharks specifically? Like why, why sharks? Have you been drawing all your life? I'm going to blame the parents. <laughs> PBS, uh, 1980s PBS, you know, David Attenborough. Um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting some of the other names now. Um, but basically PBS was, was my, my bestie. And I saw a lot of just clips of sharks, octopus, um, fish, everything related to the water. And I just latched onto it as a little kid. Um, by five or six years old, I was drawing sharks and mermaids and boats and, you know, all these good things. So they just kind of fascinated me right from the start. That's so great. And, um, what do you see to people who think that sharks are scary? Well, hopefully if we're, if we're talking online, I could just provide a really quick Google link of like a, a thresher shark. They always look like they're, they're super surprised, like best surprise party ever. That's a thresher shark. They, they just walked in, it's crazy, uh, swam in. But, um, you know, there's so many sharks out there. There are more than 400 species of sharks and more are still being discovered, especially the deep sea sharks. So to have a blanket statement of being afraid of sharks, I would say, well, let me show you some sharks that are the opposite of scary. They're silly, they're funny, they're, they're big and goofy, like the basking shark. A basking shark with its mouth closed looks like a Muppet. <laughs> like You cannot be afraid of this adorable, puffy-cheeked shark that like makes you want to hug it. It's just impossible. Great. Uh, wow, I, I can't believe that there are more than 400 species. That's yeah, more and more with more exploration. I mean, so much of our ocean water is untapped as far as what we've discovered. So seeing some of those deep water sharks that have just been discovered even in the past 50 years, how many more are there? Probably quite a few for sure. So what is something that you wish everybody could do to help the oceans? 
I wish that, you know, we see all these posts online, we see the information in the news, we see it during news broadcasts. I was watching the news the other day, unfortunately, um, and a plastic bag just blew behind the reporter. And, you know, so we see the problem. We physically see it on our neighborhoods, on our sidewalks, in our parks, on the beaches, you know, but not exclusive to the beaches. The issue is pretty much everywhere at this point. And I just wish there was like a switch. I wish everybody was like, you know what? Yes, reusable bag. Got it, it's in the car. Uh, reusable water bottle. Got it, there's an extra one in the car as well or always in the purse, always in the backpack, you know, coffee mug. We're so guilty of wanting coffee and not bringing our reusable mug. Can we get to that place where we just say, I didn't bring the reusable mug, I'm not gonna get my coffee. You know, I mean, it sounds like a simple option, um, but I can't tell you how many times being at a cafe one that I love here locally and have asked a couple of the people who are friends of mine, you know, hey, do you guys have reusable mugs? Just curious. And they all say, yes, they do. They have some fantastic ones, but they just don't remember to bring them, you know, while they're sitting at a cafe sipping out of a, a single use cup. And it's just, I, I wish so strongly there was that switch that no matter what we would hold ourselves accountable because the corporations aren't doing it. The corporations are still putting out the single use plastic. So what if we stopped using it? You know, uh, that's a massive endeavor. That's a massive effort, I understand. Um, and it goes back to that age old saying, like it starts with me, what can I do? And I wish every person that was able to do that would just make the switch, reusables. And, start cleaning up the community, you know? Um, I don't know how else to word that. I, I'm part of a community clean up, clean up uh, every two weeks. It's not a massive effort. There aren't hundreds of people. It's a few people from the neighborhood who get together and just clean up what we can for a couple hours and we do it every two weeks, you know? I mean, it does help on that day make the neighborhood look nicer. That's so great. A lot of wish, a lot of wishing. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah, we've got um, that's part of Fight for the Ocean on Fight for the Ocean Day, which is August 30th. Um, in past years, we've also done an ocean cleanup and recently haven't because of the pandemic, but it's also something that we really value as a part of um, the work to, to fight for the ocean. So right. thank you for all that you do. Um, every action helps every little bit helps I think there is a stigma out there that says well I'm, ju I'm just one person if I do this cleanup big deal it's not going to make a difference it does because somebody else might see you doing that cleanup and somebody else might be inspired to do it and they might get their family involved or they might just switch because they saw you doing a cleanup they might think that's right I have a reusable mug at home I'm going to go get it like we're all connected, we're all domino effect little pieces that we can affect our surroundings and the people around us and do our best to lead by example. We are far from perfect, you know. Um, I'm definitely guilty of, of pouring coffee into a, a jar because that's all I had on hand. <laughs> I really wanted that coffee that day. Um, so I make sure I have, I have extra usables and I do what I can, but it's still, it's not a perfect system. So to anybody out there who's like, oh yeah, that's great. But you know, this, this, and this, well, just do what you can, you know, what's one thing that you can do, do that, you know? And yeah, speaking of um, inspiring people uh, to, to make a change, um, I myself really love the combination of art and activism. And so I'm really excited about your work because of the way that you weave them together. So I'm wondering if um, you want to say anything about how important art is to get the message of compassion out there. Definitely. Um, I would say I could, I could talk until my mouth went completely dry <laughs> and I would get a few points across for sure. And maybe some of what I said might be remembered, but 
you know, are you going to remember this talk and every single word, or are you going to remember the coloring book that includes information? You know, are you going to remember the picture that shows a mermaid swimming with a reusable water bottle, which is kind of funny, um, filling it as she goes, of course. But, um, you know, what's going to make more of an impact? What's going to stick more in your mind is, you know, going to be showing here's what's happening. And although there are tons of photographers out there and there are tons of photos out there, there are documentaries, um, highly recommend Envoy film. Uh, that's out of Australia and talking about the, the shark nets and the drum lines. And they on their social media have all those pictures of, you know, dolphins caught on the lines or, you know, little sharks caught in the nets or even big sharks, of course. Um, but birds, whales, whales get caught in those nets constantly. And I still think mm -hmm. while those photographs are so powerful, for some reason, people tend to connect more with art, like an artistic interpretation of what's going on seems to really stick in the person's mind. Um, so art through, I should say, awareness through art, activism through art seems to be just a very powerful way that we can all connect and really think about these issues and have them stick and then make the changes we need to make. Absolutely agree. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, that's all we have today for the interview. Katie, thank you so much for your answers to my questions. Um, it's been great to hear from you about this and we're so glad to have you as part of our Eat Your Ethics event. And yeah, definitely. To, um, to everybody watching, I highly recommend that you check out um, Sharktopia. The artwork is incredible. Um, and yeah, thanks again. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing that wonderful interview, Amanda. Uh, just looking at the time, I know that we are close to the uh, end of the, today's event. And so I wanna go through a few things pretty quickly uh, before we do the giveaway and the Q and A. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention is to remind you again that we're sharing all of the links that we're sharing in the chat as a follow-up in an email that we will be sending to all of you. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to cover really quickly was about aquaculture or farmed fish. Um, we know, you know, and we've been hearing throughout this event as well about how bad commercial fishing is uh, for wild species of fish, but aquaculture is also not a good alternative. And we have a great page on our website that will tell you more. As I've mentioned throughout this event, and I just did as well, we will send a follow up email, but there are some books and documentaries that we highly recommend so you can learn more about the issues. Uh, the first one that I want to highlight is Undrowned Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals by Alexis Pauline Gums. And as we mentioned before, we're doing a book club on August 28th as part of our Fight for the Ocean Week, and that will be at 1 p.m. Pacific time. Um, there's also Red Gold, Jen Teleska's book that we talked about, and a link has been shared in the chat box previously, along with a code to get 40% off of the price of the book. And this will be in the follow-up email as well. And as Lauren had mentioned, Mission Blue, which is available on Netflix, is a documentary that she watched that really changed uh, the perspective on this issue for her. And of course, you can get even more suggestions at, on our own website, fightfortheocean.com. Before we get into the Q&A, can we do the giveaway? Is everyone ready for that? Um, we're gonna set it up. And as we're doing that, I just wanted to give you a little bit more information about the Fight for the Ocean Week of events that we have. And so we'll just pull up the schedule so you can see um, what we have coming up for that. But we have some amazing vegan cooking demonstrations as I mentioned before, we have the Undrowned Book Club on Saturday, the 28th of August. And then we have an interview with the ORCA researcher, Dr. Deborah Giles uh, on Sunday. Um, and that will cover her research on ORCA specifically. And finally, we will finish the week of events with uh, another look back at ways to reduce your waste. 
And so we're just gonna cycle through some of the images of the cooking demos that we have. And these are from chefs from around the world representing various cuisines. And so we're very excited to have this be part of our week long uh, fight for the ocean effort for this year. We really hope to see you at these upcoming events and please do invite your friends and share uh, with your social network so they can join us as well. Thank you for sending in so many great questions. And so we will go right into the Q&A. Um, we've been receiving some throughout the event and on different platforms. And so we'll get right into it. Amanda, can I pass it off to you? Thank you so much. Um, I was just having trouble viewing the Q&A for some reason. So um, one question we have um, is, these are all incredible facts about our fellow earthlings. However, do you feel we can dismantle the notions that intelligence and unique abilities of animals dictate their moral worth. So Lauren, I'm gonna pass that question. Sure. Over. I mean, I think that absolutely, I mean, that's the end goal, right? Is that people stop looking at individuals, whatever type of individual they be, human or non-human animal, as worthy of something based on their intelligence, just as much is that beings should be worthy regardless of what they can do for somebody else, that we should be caring about saving the critters in the ocean, we should be concerned about saving the rainforest, regardless of what it gives human beings. Um, we're not there yet, um, but we do believe that once we continue to get people just to, you know, think about empathy, to, to see compassion as something to be proud of, to continue to, you um, really encourage that in children. I think that children in general seem to be believing and worthy and protecting things regardless of what they give to them or how intelligent something or somebody is. Um, so I think that, um, I think that we, we'll get there. I don't think we're there yet. So we try to meet people where they are by in, acknowledging the in, intelligence of these non-human animals, but also reminding them that compassion shouldn't be based on intelligence. I hope that helps answer that. Awesome, thank you so much, Lauren. Um, and if anybody else has any other questions that they want to ask, then please um, go ahead. We also have um, a comment on Facebook that I could share if anybody wants to respond to this comment. So it's not a question, but just something to respond. Um, somebody on Facebook has shared here in Mexico, you can find a lot of small places where you can buy your food for cheap. And most of the time it's from local farmers. So you support local places. Uh, just passing that to the team if anyone wants to respond to that. Yeah, I was wondering, Lauren, if you would like to respond to that so I can also type it into the uh, chat on Facebook so they can see it. Oh, um... The, just a statement on buying from small places. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish that was the case here in the US as much as it is in other places around the world. I know I've traveled around the world and it seems to be acknowledgement that it's a, another form of income for people. Um, where here in the United States, we very much, um, like everybody wants their cut, everybody wants their part. And so it's it's in a more informal sector is what I would call it in a more informal way. So I think here in the US, we tend to not allow that as much. Um, and then those who do engage in that and get, um, I'm thinking of a lot of, you know, in California, there's a lot of um, people who like Mexicans, my people, who basically go around and sell out of these little carts, you know, or they sell produce on the corners and things like that. And what happens is, is they are figuring out another way to make money, but they are not protected. So they actually tend to be victims, not only of crimes, hate crimes um, by random people, but also the police who will go up and take their money. This has happened a lot in Sonoma County where we used to be based. They'd go, they'd handcuff them, take all their money, and say, if you report this, you know, when I come, you know, that you're going to get deported, where are your papers? So they're much more victims of an abusive system here than I, when, what I noticed when I was in Caracas, Venezuela, um, or other parts of the world. Um, so I wish it was more here. And hopefully, um, if we start looking more being about local communities versus conglomerates and 
massive corporations will get to be that way as well. Thank you so much for sharing that, Lauren. Um, I'm gonna go on to another question that we have from Krista. Um, Krista's asking, what are your thoughts on aquariums as tools for education? I mean, I can take that one as well. Sure. Um, you know, I'm somebody who grew up in San Antonio, Texas, which was four hours from the ocean. And I loved sea creatures. And, you know, I completely understand that desire to want to use them as an educational tool to, to for kids like me who never really had seen the ocean and things like that. But at the end of the day, I think what that is teaching them is that other beings can be used, can be exploited. And I think that what we teach them is actually a disrespect for living beings, um, that it's okay to do certain things to certain beings in the name of science or in the name of education, instead of saying, you know what, there's got to be other ways. And you know what, we are in a beautiful time right now um, with technology really allowing us to show the beauty and creativity and, uh, of nature of animals, of non-human animals and human animals for that sake, um, to where we don't need to do that anymore. There's so much going on. When I was in Australia, they had an amazing exhibit where we were able to be with orca whales. We were able to be with seals and the children absolutely loved it. They were having an incredible time with this type of technology where it didn't involve exploiting them because they could actually see how these animals behave in the wild versus a confined artificial environment. And more and more of these types of things um, are being created. So I think that we are finally to a place, I think, where we cannot have to feel reliant upon teaching others how to exploit in order um, to teach instead of um, just going directly to the compassion and understanding of how beings are in a more natural environment. So I hope that helps. Exactly. Um, the parallel with humans have been too. Absolutely, right? They thought it was okay to take people from Africa and sh exploit them or even China and places like that. I mean, anywhere in the world where to the, the colonists, um, they look different or exotic or something, they were allowed to do that too. And that, again, you know, once we think it's okay to do to one living being, we're gonna say it's okay to do it to another. And so we need to stop that type of thinking uh, of for the greater good when it really isn't good for everybody in that situation. So Krista, great question, thank you. Thank you, Krista and Lauren. Um, we have one final question in their Q&A box um, from Shia. How can we address behavioral and system change in our messaging? It's a big picture question. Um, can open that up for anybody who wants to reply, Lauren, if you want, or anybody else. Um, I'll, I'll share a little bit, and then of course, anyone can feel free to jump in. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we talk about here at Food Empowerment Project kind of speaks to that exactly, which is the idea of, you know, individual choices being incredibly important, you know, as, as consumers, um, we are able to create change by being thoughtful about how we consume. Um, but then at the same time, it's about collective voices. So something that's said here a lot, um, you know, Lauren talks about it all the time is individual choices and collective voices coming together to, um, you know, call for those changes. So, you know, as individuals, you know, making those sustainable choices in terms of, you know, the reasonable items that we use and, and then, you know, advocating when we go to a grocery store, if we don't see uh, plant-based alternatives, vegan alternatives, um, you know, asking for that, um, you know, at your local grocery store. Um, so speaking out of, uh, helps. Um, so it's those, yeah, individual choices and collective voices. I think it's also another thing, and I, I'm, I'm not quite sure if this is what you mean, but it's also about the words that we use to try to dismantle this way of thinking. So an example of that is fight for the ocean, right? kind of everybody had told me in the very beginning, it should be fight for the oceans. And I was like, but that's not really true. When I look at a, the globe, it is one ocean. These are arbitrary decisions 
to call it various oceans. Again, these boundaries that we create. So I deliberately made it called Fight for the Ocean so that we recognize how these boundaries are created. And they're not real, right? It's all, it's all, if you look at the globe, it's all connected. And I guess I shouldn't say the globe you can actually look at satellite images of the earth now, but I mean, it is one body of water and then we call it different things. So I think that our messaging needs to try to be as consistent as possible, right? And it can be annoying for people. I know I annoy a lot of people with the way I overthink these things, but I think that that's some of it, right? If we're looking to, and I'm gonna look at your wording again, address behavioral and the system change. The system change also comes with how we talk about things. And I think that's first and foremost is, is just getting the words across that make people think. So we don't use the word American at Food Empowerment Project unless we're talking about all of the Americas, right? We use human and non-human animals to get people to recognize that they too are human. So sometimes I think that just breaking the, the you know, the twist on someone's mind, the, Getting somebody to think about something differently, I think, is is the first step many times. So I don't know if that if our answers helped um, how we might see this, but hopefully that was helpful. Awesome. That is all that we have for our Q and A today. So thank you to everybody who submitted questions, everybody who's here watching. We really appreciate it. I will pass it off to Shadania to close out. Yes, I echo that. Thank you all for attending today's event and for your interest in learning about how to eat with your ethics. As I mentioned, we will be sending you a post-event email with all of the links that we shared, but we will also be sending out a survey for everyone. And we hope you'll take the time to fill it out because it will really help us improve our future events. Our next and final event in the series will be on Sunday, October 24th at 1 p.m. Pacific time. And we will talk more about the truth behind humane labels such as cage-free, free range, and a lot more. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. And we hope to see you at our Fight for the Ocean week of events. And enjoy and bye-bye for now. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>